Hey firecrackers, it's Naomi and welcome to the firecracker department. How's the beginning of your summer going? What are you working on? What are you creating? What kind of art are you making? I've started this little project that I'm so excited about. I'm making one of those little free art galleries. Now you know they have those little free libraries where you can take a book or leave a book. Well, I'm doing one of those but with an art gallery. And I've seen them pop up a bunch. My friend Lisa Pijuan in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada has one and that inspired me. And then this past weekend I was walking along and I found like an old bathroom cabinet on the sidewalk and I was like, oh, that's my art gallery. It's fate. So my buddy Avra and I are putting it together. I just love it so much. I mean, it gets me off my computer, but it's also like, can you imagine walking along and then just seeing like a little art gallery and being like, oh, I love that art. I'm going to take it home with me. I mean, how joyful is that? It's making my heart sing these days. So that's what I'm working on. If you have one of these, oh my gosh, please write to me, firecrackerdepartment at gmail.com and give me any and all advice that you have because I'm a newbie and I would love to hear how it's been working for you. And you better believe it, there's going to be pictures. So follow along on our Instagram and Twitter, firecrackerdept, when I share these pics. All right, now, our guest this week is Chinese-Canadian actor, writer, Rong Fu. I just loved, loved my chat with Rong so much. It feels like such a privilege to have like a solid hour talking about art and people's processes as artists and how they get over hurdles and the challenges and successes. This conversation ticked all those boxes. Rong was born in Chin An, China and was raised in Toronto, Canada. She just knew at a very young age that she wanted to be an actor, case closed. So she started her classical training in theater at Earl Haig, which is an arts high school in Toronto, and then went on to graduate from York University's Acting Conservatory in 2012. I mean, practically right away. After graduating from York, Rong's theatrical debut was in the critically acclaimed production of The Crucible at Soul Pepper in Toronto, a fantastic theater. If you're ever in Toronto, find out what they're doing, go see anything that's there. And then since then, she has performed on stages across Canada in amazing productions, including the Shaw Festival Stage Kiss and the Orchard After Chekhov in Niagara on the Lake, Vertigo Theatre's Sherlock Holmes and the Raven's Curse in Calgary. Then at Toronto Tarragon Theatre, she did the Millennial Malcontent and Roseneath Theatre's Dora nominated The Money Tree in Toronto. Phew! She's been busy. Now you may recognize Rong on the small screen in shows such as CBC and NBC's Pretty Hard Cases, CBC and Netflix's Workin' Moms, CBS's American Gothic, ABC's Rookie Blue, CTV's Carter, and the CW's Beauty and the Beast. I, I mean, I'll say it again, she has been busy. Most recently, Rong plays the romantic lead Avery in CBC Gems' original Hello Again, which is a K-drama-inspired rom-com created by Simu Liu and Natalie Young Lai. Can we just take a moment and celebrate Hello Again? Not only is it a fantastic production, it's just a really unique series. I really encourage you to go check it out. And also, we have to just take a little moment to celebrate their recent U.S. premiere at Series Fest in Denver, Colorado, and get a load of this. Not only did they get their premiere at Series Fest, they won Best Dramatic Pilot in a Digital Short Series category. Come on! How's that? Well, congratulations to the whole Hello Again team. It's really an extraordinary series. I guarantee you, you will love it. It's just love. It's just any time that people like fall in love on screen, I'm just like, I love it. Go check it out. And of course, we will have those links in our show notes. Here's a little side note for you. When you're done listening to Rong's episode, you can get like the full Hello Again package because you can also listen to our podcast with creator and writer Natalie Young Lai. And then you can also listen to the producer Teresa M. Ho's podcast so you can get the full meal deal about Hello Again. And can I also give a big, big shout out to our wonderful Winnie Wong, Triple W, who is the publicist on Hello Again, and she is also the head producer of our podcast and does our publicity for Firecracker Department, and she's just killing it. It feels like Winnie kind of has the golden touch right now because everything she's touching is like awards and sold out shows, and uh, yeah, she's working hard. Now, back to Wrong. Mayflowers, Asians in the Six is a short film that Rong wrote and it premiered on CBC Canada Reflections in 2020. 
speaking of Asians in the Six, Rong is a founding member of a community collective of Asian artists in film and television called Asians in the Six as a Facebook group. In 2021, she curated a program of various free industry workshops to uplift and support fellow Asian artists, including workshops about the business side of acting and another workshop on authenticity and well-being. I'm telling you, Rong is not only an actor, creator, but look what she's doing for our community. It's amazing. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, can we just stop talking about all the amazing things that Rong's done and can I just hear the conversation? Yeah, you bet. Here it is. Here's my chat with Rong Fu. Rong, I'm so happy to have some time with you. We've met a bunch of times, right? I feel like we our paths have crossed several times, okay. but this I think yeah. this is like our first time like really getting to like sit down and get to know each other. Yeah. 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 Which is actually like the whole reason Firecracker was born was because I'd meet folks like you, like, hey, uh, you seem kind of interesting. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to find out all the corners. So this is a real oh, treat. cool. Yeah. Well, it's a treat for me as well. You started in theater, right? Like, mm-hmm. did you have yeah. an idea when you started in theater of like, this is going to be for a while, but eventually I'm going to get to film and TV land? Oh, um, no. I, I, I think like when I graduated from school, like I graduated from school and I went straight into um, rehearsals at Soul Pepper, and um, which I was that's not a bad about. landing. I yeah. was I was <laughs> very lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then I wanted to do film and TV right away. I wanted to give it a shot. Um, it terrified me. I still remember because mm-hmm. I, I hate seeing myself on camera and I still do. Um, it terrified me, but I wanted to yeah. I wanted to work. And I think that's always the thing that's driving me. It's just like, I like to work and I want to work. Mm-hmm. It seems like you knew that you wanted to be an actor early too. Like, I, I think I read somewhere that you were like, at 12, you were like, okay, sign me up. This is where I belong, which I yeah. think is extraordinary. Like a lot, a lot of people have doubts into their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. So <laughs> yeah. How did yeah. you know? What was that inclination that pulled you towards that? Like I joined the, um, my middle school's drama club. We you know, did drama exercises. I was learning to mm-hmm. play around on stage and I did like a monologue in our like holiday concert. Mm-hmm. And like, that was my first time ever like acting in front of an audience. And I just right. remember having so much fun with it. And it was actually after the holiday performance, my French teacher who before then, like, I don't think we ever really had much of a connection. She made a point at the beginning of the class to be like, wrong, what you did, like, I, I never thought you could do that. That was really impressive. I thought you were really great. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't even from like anyone in acting or drama. It was like my French mm-hmm. teacher that I never connected with, Yeah. like suddenly like noticed me and, and we had, and then we were able to build a connection. And I think yeah. that was a moment where I was like, oh, I'm, I'm doing something that where, where I get to, yeah, like, like make connections with people. And then I was kind of hooked from there on. And uh, yeah. yeah, so it was just all my middle school drama teacher, which actually last winter, after like 19 years, we met on the set of Sky Med. And no he was my drama way. teacher here in Ontario. So I had no idea. His name is David Lawrence Brown. And he was using like, a, a, he was using like a stage name on the call sheet because he was still an educator. Like he was teaching in Winnipeg. And so he didn't want like, I guess, crew members in case they were parents of his students to, to catch on. Um, so he had like this stage, he, his stage name was like Felix Montgomery on the call sheet. Oh my God. So, like, so it, subtle. It was so <laughs> subtle. So like I, that, I, it didn't connect until we were sitting next to each other. And I was like, this man looks like Mr. Brown. <laughs> and then I, I, I turned to him and I was like, you look exactly like my middle school drama teacher. And he just kind of had like a little smile creep up. And it was just, I never imagined that we would reconnect like that, like on, wow. like on a set, like doing what we both love. Yeah. And I admire him so much. Like he's like, just hearing where he went after middle school, like, you know, that the learning that he went to auditions during like lunch periods and like PA days and was filming while he was teaching us. Like, it was just incredible. Yeah. I know we have these, this perception of like our mentors as like living the easy life, right? Like they're just yeah. like, what? So didn't you just say, oh, I'd like to be in that show. And then they put you on that show. Yeah. Cause you know, you ha- hold them in such high esteem. So you yeah. went to Earl Hag uh, school and then York and mm-hmm. then right into Soul Pepper. So it does like from the outset, look like you just went bloop, bloop, bloop off to the races. 
yeah did you that, ever have like doubts in your in your mind along the way or were you just like I just want to work I just want to work yeah of course like I've had doubts along the way I went to an arts high school for the first time and I was like the only I didn't know anyone else uh, at the school mm. and it was a huge school too like it has yeah. like, really like over like 2,500 students <laughs> it sounds so silly now like reminiscing about high school I remember my first report card and I got mm-hmm. an 80 in drama which was my major and in our yeah. school at the time like 80 is considered like you're on the line like that, that's kind of failing oh like, really you know I was yeah, like 80 for you're your a major. genius <laughs> no 80 is like that's that's you're on the line for for failing okay. and in your major and for like our academics it's like 60 so I remember I got like an 80 in drama and I like I just lost all my confidence. I was right. like, because I was also surrounded by kids who were like raised in the arts, who were, mm-hmm. who had parents that were artists. And I just felt so like a flick, just like a fish out of water. And I was just like, what am yeah. I doing here? Like, I don't measure up. And, and of course that happens like throughout, like in university as well. I almost didn't go back and finish my fourth year because I was so fed up with the training and the school. And mm-hmm. I was kind of like this, were you just on the same groove as the way the, the York training was going? No, I mean, I had like, I had some issues with some of the, the, the training in my third year. I felt like in acting class, like we were crossing the line between theater and therapy a lot. And I didn't appreciate mm-hmm. that. And, you know, like when I was in school throughout high school and university, I was still doing like a lot of theater programs and like playwrights units and all of that stuff outside. So I had like an understanding of how, you know, artists in theater worked, right? you know, and I had an experience of that kind of professionalism. And then when yes. in theater school, all of a sudden that professionalism gets pushed aside and you, you know, a lot of room is given to students to, you know, is essentially like manipulate them into having breakdowns, looking at it from the sidelines and like, that's, that's not, you know, that's not how we work in a rehearsal hall. Like if I were to like have like, an emotional breakdown on like a, on a show. Like that's not, yeah that's not appropriate. And I felt no. like they were teaching us the wrong messaging that it's okay yeah. to be self-indulgent and to like dig through your life and try to find trauma if there isn't any and rightfully. Right. And if there is trauma, then I'm sorry, but like an acting class, it's not the place to deal with it or take an acting therapy class specifically, right? Or see a therapist, like you need professional help. And I felt like in theater school, that line got crossed often and with with like teachers who weren't equipped to deal with the aftermath, you know, to to help you with it. Like I was really turned off by that. I get it. I find that really interesting because because that kind of like delves into our process, right? Because the challenge of an actor and, you, you know, uh, this is my perspective, but the challenge of the actor is to like, look at who you are and bring that to your characters, your roles. Mm-hmm. But then when it crosses the line, like you're saying, like, how do you, how do you make that uh, delineation between like addressing what is deep, whether it's trauma, whether it's not trauma, something that is true, how do you balance that? I, I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, that was a question that I raised as well. I remember mm-hmm. I was like, how do we protect ourselves so that yeah. we can sustain our work? And so we don't, you know, have like a breaking point where we can't continue or we do something that's harmful to ourselves or to people around us. That was like a legitimate yeah. question I raised. I agree. And I think it's just, tricky because yeah. you're asked to dive deep and then that's a really vulnerable place to, to, to be. And if yeah. the director or a teacher isn't responsible, then it's really, it can be quite dangerous. Yeah. And my acting teacher's response was, well, you know, actors are just like magical people. We have a switch okay. that we can flick on. And I was like, okay, that's fucking okay. bullshit. And I, <laughs> no was like, I was like, no, I mean, it's hard. I think if you, it's always a challenge to bring yourself into the role. I think you have to like really investigate your boundaries you know, and like really mm-hmm. understand, I mean, for me, it's my experience that I'm taking, helping to tell the story of the character that I'm playing, mm-hmm. or am I dipping into a place that's actually about me trying to deal with my personal issues? Right. And because, you know, when you have the catharsis of dealing with that, it can feel good and it can make you think like you're doing acting 
but I always try to tell myself, but am I telling the story of the character or am I telling the story of me? Yeah. Because right now my job is to tell the story of my character. I don't know. It's, it's a hard conversation to have with yourself. It is. Isn't it constant though? Like, aren't you, yeah. every time you hit another role, aren't you diving into unknown territory? Like how do you approach your work? I mean, first of all, I think like a lot of roles that I get cast in aren't really roles. And I'm like, bingo, that's me. Um, it's not. It's uh, no, I don't. I don't find that I get cast. So a lot, I actually, mm. you know, to be honest, like most of the time I get cast in something. I'm like, really? Me? Uh, really? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. When's the last time you played a role that you were like, this is a far stretch? I did a role on Hudson and Rex. That was like this really like pompous kind of like snooty dog dog lady. And she was clearly written to be like a much older woman. And then, <laughs> and like, I still remember in the script, uh, you know, she was still written to be like in her fifties or something. And the director was like, oh, just ignore the script. I'm sorry, we didn't update it. But it's like, no, you're, you're the person we wanted for the role. And I was like, okay. Yeah. So that was kind of like a little, you know, like these like little character-y parts. I'm just so curious about people's mm. process with that kind of thing. Cause I think, you know, we all, I don't know, you get the audition and then you start the process. Like what are your first steps to diving in? Not just for an audition. And you can tell me, does this cross over theater and film or is it the same approach? It depends on the role. I mean, mm -hmm. I think there are some roles that require almost no work because um, the writing is clear or the character is clear. It usually comes with the roles that are a little bit more unclear or a little bit more outside mm -hmm. of myself, usually stuff that requires a bit more research. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I think my approach has always been pretty script based. It's, right. you know, what is the story? Who is this character? What, what do they want? What is their journey? And I try my best to tell the story of the character. I, I really do view myself as an actor. That's, you know, like, a, like, you know, like, it, like, it's a service industry job almost like I know that's not right. a very okay. good way of looking at it, at it or from an artistic perspective, but it's. I kind of look at it like I'm in service of the story or in service of the play or this, you know, with a script because I have in roles previously where I try to dig up things within myself to, for, for the role. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel good. It didn't, I didn't feel like I did my mm -hmm. job. You know, like I, I felt like I was being self-indulgent. I felt like uh, I wasn't telling the story anymore. And like, I don't know, I, I think I'm just like a very practical person. Like I want to do my job well. And if I'm not doing mm -hmm. my job, then what am I doing? Yeah. I mean, I don't think that we're like these magical beings, like your teacher said. <laughs> yeah. <know> that. <laughs> yeah. But I do think it's like a really interesting process of like when you do dive into a role and the line of it being self-indulgent versus serving the story. Mm -hmm. And have you found that like when's the last time you were in a character that you felt um I don't know almost like that you were breathing the same air as that character you know that you just felt completely at home I mean two roles come to mind like me one is the role in hello again it's a character that I you know I remember reading the audition size and I was like oh I know this girl I was like mm -hmm. this girl's me this girl's my best friend this yeah. girl's like I know exactly who she is and also watching it I think everybody's also going to go oh that's me like yeah, it's so relatable so. the way you play yeah. it is so beautiful like really oh. And then the other role that I, I had so much fun playing with was um, the last time I did a play, which was um, Sherlock Holmes and the Raven's Curse at yeah. the Go Theater in Calgary. And my friend Jenna Rogers directed it and she was fantastic. And that was such a fun role because it was kind of like, um, if I can live on stage as like the best version of myself, the most fun version of myself, it was that role because mm -hmm. she was like this fierce, you know, globe trotting treasure hunter Scottish Chinese cousin of Sherlock Holmes and like Love the it. only person that he loves and respects and is perhaps yeah. and, and is smarter than him you know like so as you get to play like this heightened glorified version was a lot of fun like I just I just remember like every time I stepped onto that stage I just had so much fun because I was just like I, I get to embody like the superhero version of myself oh I love that I mean don't you think that when you play roles like that there has to be like the confidence to take those leaps Mm -hmm. You know, because that's like you're taking up a lot of space as that character because that character is that way. Yeah. But uh, to have confidence. So, you know, when you talk about having your confidence shooken in um, school, how did you get back up? How did you keep going through that? Or now even like I think even now this business is not for the faint of heart. So <laughs> no, it's it not. shakes our confidence constantly. Yeah. I mean, my confidence is still shook, like watching hello again on, on Saturday. My confidence was totally shook after that. Mm -hmm. It's constantly, I'm like my own worst critic. And right. yes. 
it, it's 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 a little sadi- like sadistic because like I love the work but I also hate my work like I hate like I, I'm not I'm never happy with the product that I, I I put out I mean I don't know do you think Picasso finished his bit and be like and done this guy, and, like I'm sure yeah. he still looks at it and goes it could be a little bit more cubey anyway that's not a yeah color. yeah <laughs> it could be a little bit more blue <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, just a little bit more. A little bit more. Yeah, like I, it's it's constantly being shook. I think, I don't know how do I get out of it? How do I get out of it? I think like having support from friends and colleagues mm. really help. You know, like I sometimes do need like a good talking to after um, of like, you know, you're not crazy. You're being really hard on yourself. And I, and I think what always brings me back is just the love of it. Yeah because there's just nothing as fun and ridiculous as acting. Right? Like and it's getting the most, paid for this? Yeah, it's like ridiculous. we have the most ridiculous job in the world. And you're like, why wouldn't I want to do this again? Like, I don't want to sit at it. Why desk. wouldn't I suffer through lacking in confidence all the time? Of course I will. <laughs> Happily, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And then yeah. there's also the weird thing because there's also moments where you feel very confident or at least there's yeah. like always a moment in a show or a moment in a shoot where I feel really good. Mm-hmm. And then eventually always follow by, you know, where I feel like I just want to live under a rock. Yeah. It's over. It's I think what am I doing? You seem to have a really good work ethics too. Uh, I'm, it's, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm outing you. No, it seems like, you know, you like the work you're, you, you're driven by getting the job and doing the best you can. So it's not like, um, you're not leaving things to chance. You're working hard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to work. I mean, it's, it's funny because I think I, I, I think I give off the impression that like I'm a really hard worker and like a really big time go getter. And I really yeah. am not like Naomi. I was just okay, good. like, I was parked on my couch. I was watching anime right before our interview. I was like, I was yeah. chilling. I think I, I've learned, I, I, like I have worked very hard and I have put in the time. And I think I'm now at a place where I've learned to work more efficiently. Oh yeah. Tell me and what I that, think- what that means. Cause that's a shift, right? I think you're right that. I just found like a whole bunch of my old theater notes from when I was in theater school. First of all, I'm not a good student, but just like pages and pages of nonsense that you can boil down. Like, as you said, what's, what's your shift been from to make it more economical and efficient? I think it's trusting myself, like Mm. trusting that my instincts are right. I think, whereas before I would always constantly look for another answer, I would constantly try to look deeper, try to like look behind the corners and try and find, dig something else up. Eventually I realized none of that is playable, (laughs) you know? Yeah. I can't play like five alternate versions of where the scene could go. (laughs) At the same time. (laughs) You're magical. So maybe you can. But, you know, I was just, eventually I was just like, I can only play one thing and I'm going to trust that where yeah. my instincts take me are right. And I think that's kind of where I trusted that like what I come up with is good enough rather than thinking yeah. there's always something else or there's, I'm missing something. Right. Because at the end of the day, I was like, it's not playable. It's not playable. I can't play all of these different yeah. ideas at the same time. I can only pick one or two, right? Yeah, that's interesting. Did you find like when you started doing more film and TV that you had to shift your process a lot? from where you were as a theater artist? Yeah, it's like with film and TV, it becomes, it's, it's so much more condensed and you don't get the chance to ever go back and do the scene again. Although I wish I can, like every time. Oh my gosh, um, every time. Like every time. Like, I'm always the person, don't you want one more take just in case? Just don't in case, yeah, yeah, just in case. Like, I think I blinked too much. <laughs> like, yep. Yeah, like I, I think film and TV is a lot more condensed. So I, the focus becomes a little bit more like immediate on mm-hmm what is this character trying to achieve in this present moment? Because they don't have the foresight of what's about to happen. And I guess like in in theater, it's the same way too, but in theater you get like, because you do the whole entire performance in one go, you kind of have to kind of start connecting those dots a little bit earlier because you're only shooting a scene or two. You're in that present moment and like you need, it, it needs to stay fresh. It needs to, you know, like stay. Yeah. Stay in the moment. I think that you're right though. Like, you know, when you're doing theater, you get to live, in that character for two hours yeah and in film and tv you're like dipping in and out dipping in and out yeah dipping in and out yeah 
it's hard. Like maybe I'm actually just not very good at that yet. Like I'm not very good at like, <laughs> I don't, no, I don't think so. True. I think that like, even think if maybe... you're doubting, I'm going to check your IMDB and be like, no, no, she's doing a good job. You're working no, consistently. I... You're, you're making things happen. No, but I, I think it, there is something about like, um, yeah, like connecting the dots, like throughout the episode or throughout an entire season. Yeah. It's like, maybe I'm actually just not practiced enough in, in doing that yet. So I, that, that's actually something I, I need to continue and investigate and work on. Well, I mean, I mean, like, how do you feel like when you carry shows like for seasons, like beyond, like, do you f- kind of focus on like what's right in front of you? Or do you try to like drop things in for what's to, what you know will come down the road? Yeah, I guess that is a good question. I think I think it makes you live a little bit more presently mm-hmm. because you don't know the next episode that's coming up. And mm-hmm. as, as you said before, you sort of rely on the writing to guide you. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you're a writer as well. You're a creator. So you must like, do you, do you find yourself in your brain sitting there as a, as a writer sometimes in, in the process of, uh, of what you're doing on film? Yeah. I, yeah. Like sometimes I do have like the writer's hat on and sometimes I go like, yeah. oh, this doesn't connect this, this idea doesn't match. Like right. this character arc doesn't track. And that's like the, the biggest thing for me is like, this is track. Like this yeah. doesn't make sense that this character is now doing this. It's a, this a line up with what they want in the show and I feel like that's one of my biggest pet peeves is just like you know a character suddenly being injected for exposition or for the development of the other character and that's always something that like really bothers me so I'm like then this character loses agency well I mean what do you do in circumstances like that when you feel like your character is being taken off track yeah that's a good question I'm not very like I would I, I I would like to say I speak up about it right <laughs> I would like to say I, I make notes and feel confident to send the writers notes but I I haven't done that yet and I think in small ways I try to shift it you know because I think film and mm-hmm. tv is a little bit more uh, forgiving with lines and stuff you can kind of you know adjust the lines um to fit the character a little bit more so like little shifts like mm-hmm. that but yeah like I actually don't have the confidence to uh to go to the writers and and <laughs> have my concerns heard because it's such a different process right like you know like film and tv mm-hmm. they have the writer's room whereas like in theater like you know we do table work for the first week and the playwright's right, right. right there and I can voice all of I have space like space is built in for me to voice my mm-hmm. concerns or my or my questions um but I yeah. find in film and tv it, I don't have the confidence to to speak and I wish I do if the opportunity comes again I will definitely challenge myself to do that mm-hmm. if it's appropriate like if the script's yeah, great then I'll important. just shut up and I'll do I'll say the lines but, yeah right yeah <laughs> but like I get it like I don't have the confidence to do that either I totally understand that I just I just think it's important so that going back to the storytelling right you can't tell a story that you're uncertain about yeah so it makes sense to me. I also have like weird hierarchy blocks in my head. Like, you know, I'm very much like this person has this job. This person has that job. I don't cross the line. So it's, yeah, it's like I watch actors who are like just, you know, like incredible advocates for their character on set and, and are, yeah. you know, have to have like the confidence to, you know, pull the director aside or the writer's director and like really talk through what they want in their scene and what they want for their character. I really admire that. Like, I wish I had that kind of confidence. Where do you think you get that from? I don't know. I think from regret, maybe like if enough, (laughs) like I think if enough regret builds up in me, you're like, enough, enough. I have to speak up now. I don't know. Okay. Well then looking at your career now, can you see that it's changed since when you started like are you more forthright now than you used to be yeah I think so I I have to like constantly remind myself that like part of my job is not just showing up and saying the lines but part of my job is advocating for my character like bringing my thoughts to the script bringing my thoughts to the story like bringing myself into the project and that's something Mm -hmm. I have to constantly remind myself because it's very easy for me to just go like okay Ron just show up and say the lines and just get out of there (laughs) like you know well, what do you think it is that you bring? What's the thing that uh, that only you can bring to a character? Like in, in terms of like the, the project overall? You know, we're in an industry, there's, there's 20 of me. Mm-hmm. So what's the thing that I'm going to do that's going to be different from those other 19 Naomi's? I don't know. I, I think it's just like 100% just myself. Like I can't really... Yeah you know, like whatever it is, like whatever sens- sensibilities, like my experience, my, the, the lens that I look at, like look through the world because of it, like that's, 
that's you know 100% me like like no one's ever going to look at the same character the same way right and to just trust no. that my interpretation is my interpretation and own it and like it doesn't mm-hmm. and i and and i don't have control over whether or not that's the best interpretation or the right one right but yeah i have to do it my way yeah 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 has your vision of your career changed uh, and if so, how, like from where, when you started doing something like warehouse 13, that was one of your first credits. Yeah. And then now you're doing like this beautiful series. Hello again. And I know you've got a role on star Trek. Mm-hmm. Like, is this where you thought you'd be? Oh, I'm sound like such a jerk. When I say like, I thought I would have gotten here a lot sooner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're alone. I don't think you're alone. Like I'm so right. thankful. Like I, it, it, like, yes and no. Right. Like I think it's about time like I, yeah it's yeah. about time I'm just I, I feel ready you know like I, I no, I do mm-hmm. look back at myself in my early 20s and um, you know I don't think I ever fit like an ingenue uh, type I think I, I sit a lot older so I, I never really fit in the young 20s energy um, mm-hmm. and I think if I found success like huge success really early in my career I think I would be a monster by now <laughs> <laughs> you know I think I would like be. like a like a diva like yeah um, like I those think people on set don't look at me in the eyes people like maybe not to that degree but I think <laughs> I think I think having experienced uh failure and having experienced you know not feeling like and doubts in my career I think it's humbled me it's made me realize like what's important is the work and everything else like you know uh that's attached to the idea of success in acting is Mm -hmm. um that's not what that matters and that's not something that I'm interested in chasing at least because because I now recognize that that's a completely different job um and not the one that I I I fell in love with um I I wish I got the experience that I've had in the last two years earlier in the sense of like I think about how much better I could have been as an actor because you need those right. reps to get better, right? Um, in the mm-hmm. pandemic, in the last two years, I've had my best career years in film and TV. Like it was like, you know, mm-hmm. I booked Hello Again and like all of the roles I booked on TV were recurring roles, were recurring guest stars. So I got, had a lot more to chew on and got to yeah. you know, come back to set. Whereas before, most of my roles were like day player roles. And, you know, I show up and I'm like, see you never. Um, yes, exactly, have, exactly. Yeah, but that's having, hard. Like that's hard to keep your muscles limber as actors. Like yeah. when you haven't got what you had this past two years. Yeah. So I really wish I had that experience early because I because I, yeah. I can feel myself getting better and more comfortable on set. And I mm-hmm. wish I'd gotten that sooner. But I'm also, you know, but I'm also again, like if I found like huge success early in my career, I would be a monster by now, probably. <laughs> I just I can't see it, but just an awful I'll, person. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a great character. I'd like to see you play, but I just can't see it. <laughs> yeah. So then mm-hmm. is there something that you do to infuse your life to keep your muscles limber? So when you aren't being given roles, I know you started the um, Asian in the Six, but that was mm-hmm. a while ago. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you doing to keep your muscles going? Well, what I'm doing is I actually found in the last two years, trying to find more of like a physical routine for myself, ah. trying to find a little bit more discipline in myself. Cause I also like, I think I like a lot of people in the beginning of the pandemic, I was like, the world's ending. I am drinking right. and eating all the noodles and doing nothing. And so much pizza. <laughs> so much pizza. And I was just oh, like, yeah. I hit a point where I got, I felt my muscles atrophy. I was like, I'm not, you know, really? like, both, like literally and also like, yeah. um, and also just like artistically, I was like, I was very uninspired. So I started um, just giving myself more of a routine. So like, you know, mm-hmm. I start the mornings with yoga and then I try and do a walk in the middle of the day. And towards the end of the day, I do another workout. So I kind of just in like a very physical way, force myself yeah. to have a little bit of discipline. And I think that's kind of helped me to kind of, you know, keep my body sharp, but also kind of keep my mind sharp because I will retreat into a couch so fast. Yeah. Like it's just, <laughs> that's right. But you're, as you said, you're acting or your artist muscles, like mm-hmm. it's one thing going for walks and things like that. But I, I, I hear mm-hmm. that. I think our artist muscles can get really flabby. <laughs> yeah. Easily. Yeah. It's and so what'd you do for that kind of, for, for that kind of workout? Well, I took a couple of classes. Like I, I was like, okay, let me try something different. So I took some like animation classes because I was oh, like, cool. this is something, this is like a world that I um, have never gotten into. And then it's one that I would really like to. And I was just like, you know, rather than 
you know, sending in tapes thinking, I know what I'm doing. Like, let me try and uh, take some classes. And mm-hmm. it was eye opening, right? It was just like, oh, of course, like there's, it's a completely different skill set. And that was a really good reminder that like, you know, like the, the learning doesn't stop. With Asians in the Six, we like hosted, um, we came together and we hosted a bunch of free workshops for our community. And that was oh, cool. also kind of coming During through. the pandemic? During 2021, yeah. Oh, it was because um, we were still quite isolated and we were like, we really want to, we really, really miss the connection of, you know, just seeing each other in the in, in audition rooms and, and bubbling into each other at shows, right? So mm-hmm. we got together and we were like, why don't we just like create a little something that we can touch base with with each other and and kind of keep our inspiration up and and, mm-hmm. and going so we um we curated like uh, workshops on producing writing acting and we did one on mental health in the beginning of the year and it was all kind of intended to just kind of like yeah keep the conversations going we asked for like you know we you know found panelists uh who were able to speak on those subjects and it was just about like trying to keep all our muscles warm to kind of inspire mm-hmm. each other and to, you know, kind of remind each other that like, Hey, we're, we're here for you. Like we're yeah. you know, like, you're not doing this alone, especially during the pandemic and the way we oh audition now, yeah. you feel so isolated. Yeah. So yeah. isolated. So what was the impetus behind starting Asian in the six originally? Um, that actually started in like 2018. Like we all met up at like Mill Street Pub. And, and by the end of the night, we were like, let's enter the 48 hour film challenge. Uh, so about nice. like 20, it started with like about 20 of us and then ended up like a, a handful of us. Uh, so I, I wrote a short film called May Flowers. We ironically, as a group of Asian artists, picked Kung Fu as our category, like martial arts right. film as our category. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, okay I guess I have to write a martial arts film now um so we entered that project and it it got to like best of fest it won best director and then our um director and producers uh, like Mariana and Julius and Connie they uh decided to uh they wanted to um uh uh, tour the film so we so so they entered into like a bunch of festivals until eventually it landed on uh, CBC Gems so as a writer, I was just kind of like, well, my job is done. And I was just so impressed <laughs> by their drive and their, their an, an ambition to make it so far. And so I'm just like a very lucky benefactor of their hard work. Um, but that's, it, was that the first thing that you wrote? That was the first thing that I wrote that was out of shot. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. did that uh, give you like the, the spark to keep going in, in writing work? In some ways, like I haven't written as much since. Like I, I wrote, but I, I haven't written anything that I feel is something that I really want to pursue Mm -hmm. yeah but Mm -hmm. it was it was a that was like a really nice refresher because it wasn't something I was also at a point where I wasn't uh writing as much anyway so it was a really fun challenge to be like you have no choice you have to write this thing in an hour Um, yeah yeah and so that was good old deadlines good old deadlines and that's the thing right I'm terrible at setting my own deadlines that was really fun so yeah that was like a you know it started as with a you know with a couple of beers and and now we're like this like online community of like like over 200 people who you know it's oh. like it's just like a Facebook group right like it's just you know people yeah. post things where they they need help or casting or resources and it's just um yeah this year we're kind of just like letting the group um organically find its way so that it's yeah. not but uh def- but definitely last year we were like oh I, I like we really want people to feel like again this is a resource that they could use so let's curate a few things where you know, people get to know us and know that we're here for them and know that they can reach out to each other as well. And yeah, connect. Yeah. Do you feel like a responsibility for towards your community for doing something like that? Because not everybody creates platforms for that kind of support. Yeah, I think I have always done that. And um, like I used to curate the wrecking balls. I don't know if you've ever been to those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was, have. I, they're one of my favorite things in the world. It, it's always a surprising event. Those, yeah. those uh, nights. Yeah. Yeah, I love those because it's just like you get a really incredible artists, comedians, musicians to come together and, and like throw something mm-hmm. up. I really miss events like that because that's just a great way Me to too. Mm. like be introduced to new artists, connect with them. Or if you're an artist who's working on something to flex those muscles. Um, so, yes, I used to curate like Wrecking Ball. I used also curated like 
uh, development series at Soul Pepper for Asian artists. And I used to like volunteer to be a mentor for like the Amy Project and like other like youth festivals and stuff, just because mm-hmm. I benefited from all of those. Um, mm-hmm. And so I've always felt like I want to give back. I always make myself available for young Asian artists, to, you know, for coffee, for, for mentorship, because I definitely wouldn't be where I am if it was weren't for, you know, like incredible theater artists who took me under their wing or who gave me opportunities mm-hmm. and uh, mentorship. So I think that's really important. Who are some of those, uh, those folks that, that gave you a helping hand along the way? Oh man, so many. I mean, like, uh, oh gosh, these are all coming back. Like Andrew Lamb and Paula Wing at uh, Tarragon. They ran mm-hmm. a young playwrights unit that I was a part of. Um, right. I was a part of. And um, there was a Paprika Festival. That was my first experience meeting other young artists in high school uh, that were not right. in my arts high school. Uh, so Natasha Minout, which was, was a big part of that. And then, you know, Nina Liakino, uh, uh, she's an yeah. incredible woman. I remember I- Incredible. I was 16 years old. Like my email at the time was banana earthquake at (laughs) hotmail.com. So professional. (laughs) So professional. And I remember emailing (laughs) Nina, I was 16 and she was running the undercurrents festival at factory, which was like a Uh new place. And I was like, hi, Nina Liakino. My name is Rong Fu. I'm a grade 11 drama major at Earl <laughs> so I can't oh it. it was like a huge thing. I was like, I really want to write plays. And I think I would be a great addition for the Undercurrents Festival. And I was oh like, oh my gosh, so ballsy. I love it. And then she, she forwarded my email to, um, to like, I, what I didn't know was Undercurrents also had like a youth program within it. So she yeah. forwarded my email there and they, and I joined the, the youth program. And, you know, I got to meet uh, artists like Winnie Mangesha, who came in and did a directing workshop um, wow. and like Romeo Candido for like sound and uh, David E for playwriting. And, uh, really? and that was kind of like, you know, being incubated with like other artists and specifically artists of color in theater. That was like my yeah. first time being like having an understanding of what that world is like and what the challenges yeah. are and, you know, being told like you have to work twice as hard that's really formative, you know, yeah, like I continued on working with Mina at uh, Fujian and I was in the playwrights unit a few times, I was playwriting residence and uh, Terracon as well, and uh, yeah, and Factory Theater, like Ken Gass, he ran, like he himself ran a high school playwrights lab that I was a part of, right, and all of these, like, incredible, incredible artists, Marjorie Chan. I did a play with Marjorie Chan at Young People's Theater. Did you? What, What play was that? Yeah, it was called Merit Gets Wired, Oh, yeah. Um, I can't tell you much more about that. Jeff Douglas was in it. Marjorie yeah. Chan. Yeah. Uh, who directed? I think Maya. Maya Arnold maybe directed it. Yeah. Yeah, but she's fantastic. I'm just such a. She's yeah. Delightful. I mean, Marjorie's such a she's such a champion for for artists and and women, mm-hmm. and she's she's so kick ass. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and so many. I'm like, oh my gosh, all their names are coming back. And like Nev Beatty, like Beatrice Pisano, Amazing. like yeah, all of these. What like, a community. Well, it's a huge community. Yeah. Yeah. So then as a playwright and film writer now, do you feel like, do you, do you have like a story that you need to tell or do you, you know, cause you've been writing plays for so long, more than mm-hmm. a lot of kids, like you've been writing since high school. So mm-hmm. do you have a story that keeps coming up over and over again that you need to put out there? Yes and no. Like I'm, I'm going to be very honest. Like I, I, I don't really call myself a writer anymore just mm-hmm. because I don't, I used to write every day. And that was when mm-hmm. I felt like I was a writer. I don't gotcha. write every day anymore. And Do you so miss I, it? Yes and no. Because mm-hmm. I think acting was always what I what I loved yeah. first. And then I fell into playwriting and I was told that I was really good at it and I should keep going. And I went <laughs> along with it. But it was to a point where like it, I, I kind of, I really, I, I got burnt out and I, and I lost yeah. my passion for it. And I remember having a conversation with um, Beatrice Bacino, uh, I was uh, having a conversation with her and being like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know what I want to write. Like, I don't know if there's a story that I want to tell. And she just said, then stop. Mm. She just said, stop. Like you can yeah. take some time and like sit back and listen. And you don't have to force yourself to try and tell stories. Cause I definitely mm. was getting to a point where like, I felt like you know, and part of my frustrations was like, I felt like I had to write plays that got grants. Um, right. Yeah. 
and that, and those weren't the stories that I wanted to tell. You know, oftentimes in Vietnam, yeah. there's like, you know, you're an Asian woman, write stories about being an Asian woman, write stories about being Asian, how hard it is, and your cultural history and the tragedies and your identity it must be so hard being an Asian woman. And I'm like, it's not. <laughs> and no, that's not my story. You know? Yeah. Um, but it's also like, Hello Again is a story about a, mm-hmm. an Asian woman. Like, yeah. it doesn't have to be. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, it doesn't I, have I to be was hard. A, it doesn't have to have a thesis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I'm hoping that, yeah. that that is changing now. Do you see it changing that people aren't sort of saying like, write the Asian stories, just write, just write the wrong food so- stories. Like, I do think I see that change a little bit more. And I think that's the direction that I, that I want to go to, right? Because in, in all, when we talk about representation, like, and, and representation mm-hmm. obviously is very important, but it representation doesn't have to be like on the nose, right? Like, it doesn't have to be like, if I'm an Asian woman um, and I want to write, like I want to represent Asian women, I'm going to write a story about Asian women. Right. I can still represent Asian women writing a story about a car who falls in love with a farmer. (laughs) I'm in, I'd like to invest. (laughs) Because that's like, I feel like, you know, whatever story I tell, no matter what it is, no matter what the content is, it's going to be told through the perspective of an Asian woman. And what my exactly. sensibilities are, and so I, I'm, I'm excited for more stories like that. You know, I think about like Nomadland, mm-hmm. for example. Like that's a great example of like that has nothing to do with an Asian woman, it's a female, but it's an Asian woman director who directed it, and it's mm-hmm. told from her perspective. And whatever yeah. ephemeral thing it is that she adds to that story, it's there. Um, yeah, it's what makes it a, a really great film. And so I think we are seeing work like that. Do you think you'll write again? I think so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There is a, there is a story in my mind that I am dying to write. And I think yeah. uh, I just need to like make myself accountable to do, finish it. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 I understand that though, that, that whole, like we, we can burn out. And if we aren't like rejuvenating or, or I call it like filling the tank up again, mm-hmm. then you find yourself without ideas. And I think, especially like with the pandemic, Mm-hmm. when we haven't been able to travel we, when we haven't been able to see theater mm-hmm. I don't know about you but I'm I'm like craving art in any capacity how do you yeah. fulfill your 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 creative tank I feel so starved <laughs> like I'm, I'm the yeah. same like I, I feel yeah. really starved for me I like to see I like to absorb um a lot of international stories like I, yeah. I, I like reading subtitles <laughs> you know? yeah and I yeah I find, like having an access to some like a a story from a different part of the world, it kind of inherently kind of challenges my thinking a little bit. Yeah, I love that. You see nuances of things, like even if, you know, like traditions that I'm not familiar with from different cultures, I, yeah, you see the the fine strokes of that. Yeah, and then, but then you still see like the universal humanity right in it, right? It's just like, yeah, just like a different shift in sensibility that, that I find very interesting you've created so much in, in your, in your career and like, with like comedy and writing, like, how do you, how, like, how, like, I, like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at someone like you and I'm like, how do you do it? Cause I like, for me, I'm like, I think I gave up. I'm like, how do you keep going? Like, how do you keep your creative juices flowing and like to keep challenging yourself to create? Like, yeah. I mean, I think it's what you're saying too, though. You like open yourself up to things like international film viewing. I, I, I don't I don't know like I think it, it ebbs and flows our our careers are hopefully long enough that you find yourself in the dips that you can ride because mm-hmm. gosh I don't I don't really have any answers other than like I although I know I know when I'm lacking like I'm so mm-hmm. craving performing right now mm-hmm. like when you're talking about getting like a good rhythm with like um recurring guest stars like I'm just craving being in front of an audience I don't know about you yeah. but I'm just like all those things like it makes me almost come to tears about it so oh. you know like don't you yeah. miss like the other night we had like a friend we went over to a friend's place and it was a bunch of actors and I honestly just like marveled at the energy of being around my colleagues yeah and I miss that so much you know when's the last time that you had like a, a jolt of that kind of um I don't know creativity input oh my gosh um I, I mean, I think that it's like similarly, they, we went to a, a friend's house for dinner and they're also a couple mm-hmm. and they're, they're actors and just getting together, talking about the work and our frustrations yeah. or, or things that we're excited about. 
and just like getting the rhythm of like talking business or like talking mm-hmm. about the industry and, and, and thinking about our careers. And I think that was something that I realized like, oh, I haven't had that in a while. Like a lot of my friends aren't actors, right? And so, right. I mean, my partner is an actor, but, you know, during the pandemic, like, you know, like, yeah, I miss that. I miss going to lobbies or seeing people after shows. Yes. And oh my God. Like yes. being like having a pulse on things. I'm also not on social media. So I genuinely have no idea what anyone is doing. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is interesting though, because I think like what you just described about going over to a friend's house, like, I think it's just changing the air. Mm-hmm. Like I've, I've recently just realized that we get kind of in these ruts of routine. And I mm-hmm. think that routine is like the thing we crave and the thing that's the worst thing for us as well. As yeah. soon as I get into a routine, I'm like, oh, I got to shift it up. So do you find that? Do you love a routine or do you hate, hate it? Ooh, it depends. It depends. I love a routine. Yeah. I'm tired of it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then yes. I want something new. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's so interesting to see your, like your career right now, because in a, in a lot of ways, like it's kind of exploding into like great p- possibilities with Star Trek, with Hello Again. Like mm-hmm. if I had told you 10 years ago, there's gonna be a time where you're on two different shows at mm-hmm. the same time, mm-hmm. a series where you're the lead and then Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Would you have been like, yeah, that's, that's checks out. No, I would have been like, no way. Really? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. Like, like I, you I have to recognize how exciting yeah. this is. <laughs> yeah, I do. Excited like for I, me to watch you. Oh, thanks. No, like my tendency is like I, 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 I tend to downplay things because I'm, I'm afraid to get too excited about, about things. Uh-huh. You know, it's, it's a fear of like, mm-hmm. I don't want to get too excited. Um, what if I'm let down? So my, mm-hmm. I know it's not, you know, it's probably not the most healthy thing, but like, yeah, like my natural tendency is to always just kind of downplay everything right. um, that I forget to. So thank you for like, I forget to yeah. uh, look back and, and see progress because I always, you know, you always look ahead of you, right? You never look behind you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's also kind of looking at like, if you kind of look at these successes that you've had, when you look at like, I mean, gosh, right out of the gate, you were at Soul Pepper and a lot of people, that's like a a dream, like a goal, Mm -hmm. Yeah. but you've achieved that goal. So at this point in your career, do you have like a bigger goal that you're like, got your eye on? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm going to sound like such a fraud, but like, yeah, I want to create a, a series. Mm-hmm. Like I want to be in the, I want to be back in the creative chair. I want to be back yeah. in storytelling. And I'm so scared to say that, like saying that, like I'm getting the, the sweats right now, like saying that out loud because I'm like, I'm such a fraud. Like I haven't why? why do you say that that's a fraud? So long. Because I haven't been working yeah, I, on the craft. I haven't been putting my time. In. Okay. That's what, I, yeah. Uh-huh. And for me, that's very important. Like if I don't put the time into something, I, I can't feel like I, I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get it. I so understand that. And I will also say like the steps you're taking right now are leading to that. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like the experience that you've just had with hello again, or anything that you're doing is teaching you to have your own show. Don't you in your mind, like go, when I have my own show, it's going to be this. And it's <laughs> yeah. gonna be this. you're just checking, like, tell me, yeah. tell me, paint me a little picture of what your, your own show is like. Yeah. I have this idea of uh, a story that I want to develop. That's, um, it's a five season arc. It centers around food. And I, w- I really want to play with uh, genre in the show. Um, so it starts off with as like a single camp comedy, then it moves into like more of like a travel documentary, then it moves into like intimate conversations, then it moves into like a food competition. And then it kind of goes back into like single cam, like comedy drama. So, so like fun. I kind of want to explore food through all of the mediums that I love watching food entertainment told through the story of a chef, like finding her voice in food and who she mm-hmm. is. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of like this. This is the story I want to tell because I love food. Um, I think food, I love this so idea. much stories and, um, uh-huh. and I just want to create something that's everything that I love about storytelling and everything that I love about entertainment and everything that I love about food. And that's mm-hmm. what I want to create. And I just want to create this show that like trend, that takes you in and out of different mediums. I love it. Yeah. I love it. That sounds I, really exciting. And I mean, food, like you had me at, I want this to be about food. And then yeah. you're going to get like everybody going, uh-huh. Yeah, Tell me yeah. more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm excited for you. That's a really, that's a really great idea. Yeah. I mean, I actually have to do it. <laughs> Oh God. Again, the sweats are coming. The sweats are coming. I mean, sometimes you just have to say it out loud and then you're like, okay, uh, we were talking the other day about accountability and, and yeah. my friend said that they pay somebody $20 to 
just keep them accountable. Mm. So like to read their script and to say, I'm going to give you a scene on Monday. Can you read it? And I'll give you $20. And I was like, that's such a smart idea because I think deadlines and accountability are just, uh, I'm lost without those. I can't be accountable to myself because I'll be like, take a break. You're doing great. Yeah. Feet up. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) It's great. Yeah. You wrote a page. Now you can just relax. (laughs) Yeah. I also thought that the best kind of gym would be like, you have to give the gym $5,000. And every time you come back, go to the gym, you get a hundred dollars back. Yes. Right. Yes. I go all the time. I would go all the time. Yeah. Or like gym passes okay. where I'm like, I have to go, like, I have to go three times exactly. a week or four times a week, or it comes down to like, you know, I'm trying to take the cost per visit down as much as I right. can. Right. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. so I'll tell you what, why don't you give me a cool ten thousand dollars and i'll give you a thousand dollars for every episode that you write okay you just have to write 10 i just have to write 10 episodes i'll get my ten thousand dollars back they don't have to be good they just have to be done they just have to be done i think think it's great great idea i really do thank you i'm a fan um okay well let's wrap it up we'll do a little uh table turning and you're you get to ask me a question and then we'll do our wrap-up questions what were you like as a kid like what were you like do you look back on yourself as a child and go like, wow, I, I really changed? Or do you, or have you, are you, have you held on to kind of like your inner child kind of all throughout? Oh, that's good. I think uh, it's funny because my parents passed away this past year. And so I've been going oh, through so boxes hear, yeah. and boxes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, boxes, boxes of my kid stuff. Mm-hmm. So I'm finding like a little bit of a history lesson of myself. Wow. So it's an interesting, interestingly timed question. I think I was a pretty, pretty big introvert. Mm. which is people would find that shocking but I I think I mostly just wanted to hang out by myself and write stories and I'd go on sort of like imaginary adventures I'll tell you when you told me that you got like 80 percent in your report card yeah I found my theater school report card and across the board I think I had one good the rest were like satisfactory satisfactory. (laughs) so I'm not a good student I don't think I'm still a good student I'm a good procrastinator what about you do you see like you the kid in you now or have you changed a lot it it depends depends on the day depends on the day because I think Mm -hmm. like like you like I think I was also very introverted and I and I still am and I used to go through bouts with like just terrible shyness but like you I also like to like imagine and, and and daydream and and I think that's kind of like what brings like us, like into the art strategy because there's just a little bit of an escape I feel like I dip in and out of that like who I was like the two p- versions of me as a kid like one's very confident and very brassy and one is very like mm-hmm. introverted and shy and I feel like mm-hmm. I flip back and forth between those two yeah, yeah. I think I, I used to be really brassy as a kid yeah like I think I'm not I think I'm a little bit more censored now which is probably <laughs> really bad. yeah right all right let's do our wrap-up questions fill okay. in the blank for me, a firecracker is a lady who kicks ass. I love it. What do you want to be uh, known for? My humor. If your life was a movie, what has been like a, a turning point for you? A climactic turning point that changed the future? Meeting my partner. He's probably standing right there and going like, you better say it. You idiot. better say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see him, yeah. but he's like crouching under the chair right now. <laughs> my good back. answer. Good answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, How did you meet? We met at the show, doing a play together at the Shaw Festival. And I, like, I was a late bloomer uh, romantically. I was very afraid of relationships and didn't really get into very many. So he's actually my first boyfriend. Um, and we've been together for going on almost four years now. Wow. Um, and he's great. He's my rock. He's so solid. I, I always knew when I was younger, I used to like pine, like for... Uh, to be in love. And I always mm-hmm. knew in the back of my mind, it's going to happen later in my life. Like I'm going to mm-hmm. have to wait for this person. Like I'm going to have to become the person that I need to be, to be able to carry a relationship. And so just because that was something that was like wanting to find love was something that like really haunted me for, for a long time. Yeah. And then finally finding that person did that very much feel like a turning point. I um, bet. Yeah. Yeah. And you survived a pandemic together. So that's and we survived. Like, yeah, we got stronger during the pandemic. Um, that's amazing. So that was, that was really great. And uh, I love it. Yeah. What's something that people don't know about you? Oh, I don't think most people know that I draw. Oh, yeah. What I mean, kind? Like charcoal? Uh, like s- mostly sketches and sometimes uh, watercolor. But it's uh, drawing was actually my first love. Like I used to be. No kidding. 
yeah, I was like, I was very good at visual arts. And that was kind of like my thing before I found acting. Um, so yeah, I don't think most people know that like a good number of like pieces of art in my in my home are things that I drew myself because I would be like, why would I pay for this? I could just draw it myself. Oh well, gosh, yeah. if you have the talent, is that your cherry blossom? Did you do that? Behind oh you? no, this is Ikea. <laughs> <Not> that. <laughs> what, what, so your, what's your usual subject matter when you draw? A lot of people actually, oh, mostly women. Huh. Yeah, mostly women. I can't draw men, mm -hmm. like I'm terrible at drawing men, but um, a lot of women is is, is kind of ten that women tend to be my muse yeah i love it what has been your favorite mistake i mean if you believe in mistakes what's been something that you've done but you've learned from it oh i don't i don't know if it's it counts as a mistake but when i was in grade three that was my first year in canada i my aunt had workshopped a bunch of names for me to try out like english names Okay. Stuff like crystal and rose. <laughs> and I was like, Angelica. And, but one that stood out to me was Lily. Um, Cause I was like, oh, it's a similar flower. Cause my name in Chinese Furong is uh, hibiscus. Um, but, okay. it, but at the time it kind of roughly translated to like Lily or Lotus. So at least that was kind of my understanding. So I went with Lily and I remember one math quiz. I wrote Lily on my like assignment. I handed it in and the teacher, um, this is a, uh, I think it was Mrs. Augusta. No, she, anyway, she, um, she, she was like going through the assignments and she was like, Lily, she was like, who's Lily? And she kept calling Lily out and I didn't understand English, yeah. but I kept hearing Lily and I was like, oh, does she mean me? And then like, I went up to the front of the desk and she was just like, well, do you want to be Lily or do you want to be wrong? And I was like, I, I remember in that moment, I was like, I felt like such a fraud. I was like, I'm not a Lily. I'm not Lily. I'm wrong. Right. <laughs> so I feel like that I don't know if it was a mistake, but it was, you know, I tried something, it didn't work out, but I, that's how I kept yeah. my name. Are you glad you kept your name? I am. Yeah. Like I feel yeah. like it's very much part of me. I think about this all the time. If mm -hmm. I was Lily, Lily would have had a very pleasant life. She would have been, you know, very normal. She might've become a dentist, you know, <laughs> your name is wrong. You have to kind of, you know, <laughs> you gotta have yeah. a, you yeah. gotta kind of, you know, build, build some, some, some thick skin and, uh, Oh my gosh. I mean, it. just let alone not even speak the language you, when you arrived, that would have given you some good thick skin for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That must've been an amazing adventure. Yeah. Yeah. I forget all the time. I'm like, all oh, right, I'm an immigrant. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> like I'm not first generation. I am the immigrant. <laughs> That's right. And yeah. like to think about, I mean, you think about how hard it is to be a kid in school and then how mean can kids can be and then not knowing the language. Yeah. Like that was, that must have toughened you up. Yeah. I was actually a Chinese girl in my school who like came up to me and she was just like, you know, your name means wrong. Right. And I was like, no, you're lying to me. How could you? Because <laughs> so I genuinely didn't know. And she, she, she was like, yeah. it means wrong. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kids, kids can be so mean. All right. Um, so what's something that you haven't done yet, but you know, you have to do. Oh, skydiving. Yeah, you're one of those, hey? Yeah. So that's not on my list. You love like um, facing death is what I'm saying. No, it's actually one of my <laughs> few regrets that I had. I went to, my best friends and I, we backpacked in, well, we didn't go backpack in Europe, but we wanted to go backpacking. Our parents wouldn't let us. We went on a, a tour in Europe after high school and uh, we were in Switzerland and our cabin had bed bugs. So we spent the entire next day cleaning our luggage and we didn't get to do oh, any no. excursions. And, but I was such a good girl on the trip. I was 17. I was like, I just want to be safe. I want to see the sights. I want to be on budget. Um, but mm -hmm. I really missed out on like living. And I remember skydiving mm. was something that I was like, oh, no, 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 that's too expensive. We shouldn't do that. And I really wish I did. So that, that's mm -hmm. like, I think like one regret that I carry is like, I wish I was bold enough to like live a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. Um, what's been like the best advice you've ever received or the worst advice? I think the best advice I ever received was from my mom before I went into grade one. Um, she told me, make friends with the smart kids. She was like, figure out who the smart kids in your class are and be friends with them. And I think that's something that I've always carried because, you know, it's, yeah. it's like being in the company of people who are greater than you, right? They force you to, to get better. And so I think that's always been really sound advice. This is advice I would give to my kid to be like, find the mm -hmm. smart kids, <laughs> yeah. be friends with them. I, I, yeah. I buy it. I do. Yeah. So who's a firecracker in your world? 
somebody that you want to shine light on? Yeah, my best friend, Ewen. She's um, finishing up her fourth year as a uh, OBGYN resident. She's going to wow. her fifth year. She's worked so hard. And she's, for a lot of those, she was my inspiration for the character Avery in Hello Again. And we've been best friends since we were nine. Um, she wow. also came to Canada. She's also an only child. Um, like we're basically sisters and she's just like the best person in the world. And I love her so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she just, she kicks ass. Like she's, she's awesome. Yeah. Wow. That's like, um, I don't have a lot of, uh, grown up friends, but that's like, that must be really good to have a grown up friend that can kind of balance the nut nuttiness of our industry. Yeah. Yeah. No, she's, yeah. she's really great. I'm like, I, I really want to try and get her a job as like a medical consult on a show. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I feel like she would be so good at it. Cause she also loves like something we love to do is like, we love watching TV. So I'm like, yeah, she loves TV. Yeah. She's a doctor. She can consult on TV. It's I mean, perfect. it's <laughs> perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. Final question is advice, advice you would have given your younger self. I'm thinking about myself specifically when I was 16. Uh -huh. I was such an asshole. I, think <laughs> Why? I, I was just very opinionated. I had like, this is now so dumb. I read the Da Vinci Code and I thought like I knew everything. I was like, it's right. All, it's I mean, you were 16. I was 16. Everybody thinks they yeah. know everything at 16. Yeah. I reread the Da Vinci Code. I'm like, this is a terrible novel. Um, <laughs> but at the time I was like, I know everything. Christianity is front. Um, I would tell myself to like, you know, you don't know everything. Chill out. Um, <laughs> and be nice to your classmates like don't get into fights like <laughs> arguments which actually my best friend Ewan gave me that advice she was like you know you can be really bullheaded and like browbeat people and that's not nice and I was like you know what a real friend will call you out on your shit yeah yeah that is a real friend yeah oh well, I, I so enjoyed chatting with you and I'm so grateful you could make some time for us and I hope yeah. that when we see each other we can carve out a little bit of space or We'll bump yeah. into each other in Toronto and be like, this is our time. Carve this, is this our time, time out now. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would love that. It was so, so, yeah. so, so enjoy chatting with you. Thank you so much for yeah. your time. Yeah. I can't wait to see where Hello Again goes. I think it's a really unique uh, series. And I just love your character. I love your chemistry. It's really beautiful. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. And then that teacher was right. It is a little bit magic. It is a little bit magic. Yeah. <laughs> just like actors are a little bit magic. That a little bit magic. Little magic. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, Such thank a pleasure. You so much. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Okay. All right. Take care. Okay. See you soon. Bye. Ah, I just love, 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 love my chat with Ron. It's just an opportunity, as I said, to talk to a fellow artist and the discussion around being in service to the characters that she plays. I love that so much. Like I feel as an artist, I get myself in trouble when I don't focus on that, when I don't put art first, story first. So hearing her talk about that really uh, was a great spark of inspiration. You can now catch Wrong as Lieutenant Jenna Mitchell on Star Trek Strange New Worlds on Paramount Plus and Crave TV in Canada. That's right, Star Trek, uh-huh. And then Avery on Hello Again on CBC Gem and also Jessica in My Fake Boyfriend on Amazon Prime. Yeah, there's a lot going on in the world of wrong food and we're here for it all and I hope you follow along. For the latest Wrong updates, follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Wrong Ideas or head over to her website at officialwrongfood.com. For the latest updates on Hello Again, follow them at Watch Hello Again on all the platforms. Now let me know what resonated with you in this podcast by dropping us a comment on Instagram or tweet at firecrackerdept. Or you can always leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, or you can always be super retro and send me an email at firecrackerdepartment at gmail.com. We love, love, love hearing from all of you. It makes my day when I get a message and then I always share it with the rest of the core folks and I know they feel the same way. To see what we have going on, visit our website at firecrackerdepartment.com. And while you're there, I mean, if you haven't already, subscribe to our now bi-monthly newsletter to get the inside scoop on everything that's going on in Firecracker Department. Because there's something for everyone. Like there's the weekly writing bursts. There's the Sunday brunches where you get to hang out with your fellow firecracker peeps. We've got mentorship workshops. We've got script readings. We've got podcast guests galore. And we're glad you're here. It's always better when you're here. If you're wondering what we have coming up, 
All our events are listed on our website, firecrackerdepartment.com, and jump in. I bet they're your people. I guarantee you, you will not leave one of our events without being sparked into inspiration. And as we always say, let that inspiration take you to creative action. Because I really do think that's what it's all about. It's one thing being like, oh, that's really inspired me. But then it's another thing about taking that action. So what are you going to do? Call a friend, meet about a project, start writing that thing, clear your canvas, pull out the paints, sew something, make a meal. There's so many ways of taking creative action. And I would love to hear about all of them at Firecracker D-E-P-T. Drop me a line and show me a picture of what you're working on. I'm so, so happy that you chose to join us today. I'm Naomi, and we'll see you next time on the Firecracker Department. Winnie Wong is our Firecracker head producer. Follow her at wonder underscore Wong on Instagram and wonder underscore Wong 8 on Twitter. This episode is edited by Shane Stoltz. You can follow them at Shane Stoltz, all one word, and Shane with a Y. This intro was written by the one and only wonderful Winnie Wong. That's right, she's a triple W. The rest of the team comes at you from Toronto, Los Angeles, Austin, London, Dubai, and truly from all over the world. Thanks also to Jeff Malutinovic and Igor Korea for our theme music, and thanks to you, yeah, you, sitting there, driving there, walking there, working out there, and taking time to listen. We know there's a lot of options out there, and we really appreciate you choosing us. We hope to see you at maybe brunch, maybe the writing workshop. And until next time, thank you for listening to the Firecracker Department. We'll see you next time.